Ali Rizvi, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about your book, The yeah. Atheist Muslim. It seems like a contradictory title, doesn't it? It does, and uh, the publishers love that, right? As you know, this is a very catchy title. Uh, but uh, it's not a self-descriptor. What it actually is is it addresses the countless uh, atheist, agnostic, secularist people who live in the Muslim world who have to publicly identify as Muslim. Because if they don't, not only are they disowned by their families or ostracized or marginalized from their communities and their society, uh, but they can be prosecuted. I mean, they can be uh, put in jail. They can be hacked to death like the bloggers in Bangladesh. They can be uh, flogged like Raif Badawi in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So this speaks to them. Uh, they're closeted, they're atheist in thought, but they're Muslim in presentation um, because they're forced to be. And, and those are the atheist Muslims. Their, their existence is contradictory, they're living a contradiction. So the title addresses and respects that. And, uh, you know, you talk about all these people who've gotten in touch with you, who mm -hmm. uh, feel that this, even this title speaks to them, and it also speaks to you, too, with the uh, things that you like, parts of the things that you like, and things that you don't. Right. Uh, can you explain that a bit? Yeah, when I, uh, when I announced the title initially, I started hearing from a lot of people in the Muslim world who were atheistic, or they were secular at least, and uh, they said, oh, that describes me, that's who I am. And it was a different story for different people. So for some of them, you know, they, uh, they were closeted. They said, I can't speak about this, and so I, but I have to go to the Juma prayer. I have to pretend like I'm Muslim uh, just to avoid you know, all of the things we talked about, the persecution. Now, there are others who said, you know, my mother's a hijabi. My family's really religious, and they raised me really well. I love them a lot. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to alienate them. I believe that they're good people. I just don't believe in the religion itself. And uh, so, you know, they celebrate Eid or they celebrate the rituals and the, and the holidays, but they, they don't carry the belief. And uh, this is when I started seeing a split between Islamic ideology and Muslim identity. When I realized Islam and Muslim are two very different words. Um, because Islam is an idea, it's defined by the scripture, you know, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can't deviate from it. If you do, uh, it's called heresy, it's called blasphemy, it's called apostasy. There's you know, different degrees of terms for it. Uh, on the other hand, Muslim is, uh, really is not a monolith. I mean, you've got uh, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. The vast majority of them don't even speak the language of the Quran, which is Arabic. You know, the largest populations are in Indonesia and India, Bangladesh, and Turkey, Iran. None of these are English speaking. So, uh, or Arabic speaking, I'm sorry. So they, the, the, the Muslims as a community, the Muslim identity is much, much more diverse. And there's a lot more heterogeneity um, and diversity in the way that people think. And Islamic ideal, uh, identity is a completely uh, a different thing. That, that's really what the book uh, discusses. And so do you talk a bit about your own uh, journey as well? I mean, what made you uh, become an atheist and uh, even mm -hmm. and, and write this book. Yes, so the, uh, the book is um, semi-memoir. It is a lot of it is a memoir, uh, and I do talk about how I was raised. And I, I grew up in uh, three different Muslim-majority countries: uh, in Libya, in Saudi Arabia, and in Pakistan. And um, you know, one is in North Africa, the other is uh, the birthplace of Islam and Muhammad, and the third is a South Asian country where Islam came later. Uh, so there were very different perspectives. I saw the interplay of the religion and the culture and uh, language and uh, all of these different elements and how they come together. And being exposed to that pushed me towards secularism quite a bit. And I also went to an American school in Riyadh. Uh, which was strange because there were people with around 80 different nationalities in our school and outside it was the Taliban with a lot of money, right? Because that's what Saudi Arabia is, even now. Uh, and it, so it makes you think, you know, it makes you process the world differently than most people do when you have that experience. And I thought a lot about it and, and a lot of that journey is described in the book. Both not only culturally and what I was exposed to, but also the intellectual journey 
or how I went about questioning the beliefs and you know, also have a science background and so on. So there are many factors that played into it uh, that are in it, that are in there. It's interesting because in your talk at the Muslimish conference recently, you mm -hmm. talked about um, the scientific claims of the Quran, right. and uh, given your own background as a doctor, it's, mm -hmm. it was interesting to hear. Uh, can you talk a bit about those, uh, you know, the, the things that are said about that and yeah. the reality? There is, uh, oh, I, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> and, and this is, I think, one thing that isn't, really unique to Islam. This is across all religions uh, that there is this idea that science answers the how questions and religion answers the why questions, uh, which is not true because religion pretends to answer the why questions and it does make many scientific claims. It makes claims about the, how, you, how the universe started, it claim, makes claims about uh, how human beings came into existence. Um, uh, it, it makes all these strange supernatural claims like you know men living inside fish and uh, you know, a man flying up to heaven on a winged horse, resurrection after death, uh, virgin births. So all, all of these are scientific claims, and they can be refuted. Uh, so uh, the, what people talk a lot about when it comes to the Quran, a lot of the apologists talk about the embryological claims. And I always found this, even back when I was a little bit religious, I always found this absurd because uh, it's very easy to see through. You know, when they said that the... Um, the embryo looks like a blood clot or you know god uh, allah clothed bones with flesh and how these are supposedly miraculous things to have said in the seventh century well aristotle did it with chick embryos you know there's uh, what the quran describes is if you take an egg a fertilized chicken egg you open it up at different stages and you just describe what you see um th that's all it is there, there's there's nothing miraculous about it there's nothing Aristotle wrote about it, Galen wrote about it before, uh, and you know, in I think the third century BC or even earlier than that. So I never found this original. I don't know why people are so enamored with it, and that includes um, internationally renowned embryologists like Keith L. Moore, uh, who now he's gone back on it, but at that time uh, he, was, he was very enamored by it. So I I, I like to have those discussions. I like to refute them. Uh, I enjoy talking to Muslims who make those claims and uh, discussing why I think that they're wrong. And, and there's a whole chapter in my book called Choosing Atheism. I think it's chapter five. Uh, so I, I went through a lot of those claims specifically and a lot of the verses in the Quran uh, about embryology and about science and uh, talked about how they can be refuted very easily. Yeah. So, I mean, for someone who is thinking about becoming an atheist or questioning uh, religion, what are some of your main arguments uh, when it comes to Islam? Uh, mm -hmm. Like someone in Iran watching this program right now. Oh. My uh, main argument, what I tell people who believe, is uh, that if you want to get to know me and you can't see me, supposing I'm, I'm dead and, you know, it's a long time afterwards, you're going to try to see what I left behind. The way to get to know me is to read my books, see what I created. Um, and if you do believe that a creator created this universe around you, right? if you believe that a creator created nature, then study nature. You don't have to go to a book thousands of years ago or a hearsay from a messiah or a prophet who claimed you know, that they were sent by God. You have nature around you today. You can study it. And there's a word for that. The study of nature is called science. And the language of science is not Arabic, it's not Hebrew, it's, Arama it's not Aramaic. The language of science is mathematics. And mathematics, unlike the other languages, stays the same, whether you're in Israel, whether you're in Gaza, whether you're on the moon. And it's better to ask real questions than take refuge in false answers. And that's, the, that's how I would sum it up. Uh, I mean, some would say that um there isn't a contradiction between religion and science mm -hmm. uh, and I guess um, uh, is that something you might you you obviously wouldn't agree with but why or do you think uh, there's any way that religion and science can be accommodated well uh, in reality there are people who are able to compartmentalize uh, parts of their mind to process religion process science 
Uh, but the reason that I think that they're not compatible is because they work, they work in completely different ways. Faith, by definition, means believing things without evidence. Like, I, I don't have faith that this chair I'm sitting on exists. I know it exists because I have, you know, there's evidence, I can observe it. Uh, but faith means that uh, I have to believe things and there is absolutely no evidence, there's nothing I can observe. You know, so that, that, with faith, you can believe anything. And the problem is that with faith, you start with a conclusion and then you go backwards. Right? So you already have a conclusion. The Quran is the word of God. Muhammad was a messenger of God. And uh, now we're going to go back and we're going to look at the science and see where it fits. So it, it, you're automatically in a position of selection and confirmation bias. Um, with science, you, you generate a hypothesis and you don't try to just prove it right. You try to prove it wrong. Right? So falsifiability hypothesis generation, null hypothesis generation. The scientific method is based on starting out with the presumption that you're wrong, which is the opposite of a conclusion, and then working along, picking up evidence in, in an unbiased way, and then landing at a conclusion. And even those conclusions are often not hard and fast. You, you never, proof is, the word proof is a, a taboo word in science. You say that there's evidence for something or another. You don't say that this has been proven or not. So I, I, I feel that's more honest. I think that it's a completely different phenomenon from the way faith works. It's actually antithetical to it. So not only are they not compatible, uh, they, they work against each other. And this is why historically there's been such, they've been at loggerheads with each other for so long. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate it.